let's get started. I think by now you guys uh, should be tired or at least overwhelmed by the number of architectures that we have seen when it comes to deep learning. And we covered a lot of them. Some of them, the idea was that you wanted to get as much accuracy as possible. The other ones were also trying to be efficient in terms of both computation and memory storage. So now there is a natural question. Can we somehow automate that? Can we somehow let the computer do the hard work? It's basically machine learning and a machine should be able to find a good architecture for us. So that's the idea of AutoML and that's what we are gonna cover uh, today, I guess. And let's get this started. And I'm gonna start with this paper. It's a very good paper and it's gonna help us uh, understand the state of the art when it comes to AutoML. So prior to deep learning, for instance, when it came to computer vision or even natural language processing or speech, we had to do a lot of feature engineering. For instance, for natural language processing, people would come up with a bag of words. And some of ideas were also applied to computer vision. You could have bag of visual words, or you could take a look at histogram of oriented gradient, hog features or SIFT features. So most of machine learning prior to deep learning, when it came to computer vision, natural language processing and speech was about feature engineering. So you would spend a lot of time doing feature engineering and in the end apply a logistic regression or a support vector machine. You use classical machine learning techniques on whatever features that you managed to engineer. And then that was giving you okay results. Deep learning came and changed that paradigm. The idea was that now you can actually learn the features. You don't need to spend time featureizing your images or your text. You can actually let the neural network learn the features on its own and give it enough data. And we saw a lot of success with that up until now, but there seems to be a, uh, a saturation point where there are a lot of architectures being engineered these days by people. So it seems that the state of the art is changing from feature engineering to architecture engineering. And that raises a natural question, can we automate that? The same way that we automated feature engineering, can we automate architecture engineering? And uh, let's see how a human would approach this problem. They come up with an idea for an architecture, they train it, and then they uh, tweak the hyperparameters on the validation data set, and then take whatever that's the result of that exercise and apply it to test data. And then once everything is tested, they take it to real world. But to do architecture engineering, we saw a couple of examples before when human were doing it. You usually start with a smaller data set. You usually start, for instance, with CIFAR 10. You come up with an architecture. And once you come up with the architecture, you apply that to a bigger data set like image. So we are gonna do a similar exercise and we're gonna let the machine do the work for us. So we are gonna have a controller, which could be a recurrent neural network. That recurrent neural network is gonna sample an architecture with probability P, and that P is parameterized by the recurrent neural network. So we're gonna sample an, an architecture. We take the architecture, we train it on the training data, we validate it on the validation data, and we are gonna come up with a validation accuracy. It's gonna give you a number R. That R is now a feedback that you're getting from your system. Now you need to scale the gradients of your recurrent neural network that's proposing your P, that's controlling P. You're gonna scale it by the feedback that you got and you're gonna update your controller. You're gonna update the parameters of your recurrent neural network. And this you can do with reinforcement learning. So I think reinforcement learning, we're gonna go into more details uh, either in the end of this semester or the next semester. But for now, that's the big, big picture. A recurrent neural network is gonna propose an architecture. You take the architecture, you train it, you test it on the validation data, you get the validation accuracy, and you, the validation accuracy is gonna act as uh, feedback that you're gonna use to update your controller. So what's the catch here? You're gonna have to train. And we know that training a single neural network takes a lot of time, let alone training 1,000 of them or 100,000 of them. So that's the cost that you're paying. 
but because it is repetitive, we can uh, dedicate that task to a machine and the machine should be able to do it. Given enough resources, by the end of this process, a good architecture is gonna come out. Now the question is how are we gonna parameterize the space of architectures? And this paper has a smart way of doing that. And we're gonna see how things are gonna work. But first let's define what is a normal cell. A normal cell is a cell consisting of a bunch of convolutions and some other operations. But whatever the input resolution, whatever the resolution of your input to the normal cell is, you're gonna keep the same resolution as the output. So there is no striding operation. It means that you're not gonna lose resolution after the normal cell. Whatever your input resolution is, you have, you're gonna have the same output resolution. That's a normal cell. And a reduction cell, it's actually gonna reduce the height and the width of your input by a factor of two. So we're gonna have two types of cells a normal cell and a reduction cell. And we're gonna train a neural network consisting of a bunch of normal cells and reduction cells on C510. An image goes in, you have N normal cells, then you reduce the resolution. You have N other normal cells, you reduce the resolution, and then another normal cell, and then you do your softmax. So that's the macro structure of our C510 architecture. And our task is to come up with good cells. So the task of this RNN is to come up with uh, the structure of these normal cell and the reductions. But let's assume that this problem is solved and our algorithm is gonna work. Then whatever normal cell and reduction cell that comes out of this algorithm, you're gonna take that and put it in a bigger architecture. It's gonna be deeper and it's gonna have some other operations in it. It's bigger because now you have two reduction cells here. You have one more reduction cell here and you have N more normal cells. So it's a larger neural network. And that's the one that we're gonna use on ImageNet. So whatever the outcome of our architecture search is, we're gonna take that, enlarge it, and train only once on ImageNet and report the results. So that's the big picture for searching for architecture. Now the question is how we're gonna come up with normal cell and reduction cell. Hey, professor? Yes. Doesn't this limit the structure to like this alternating like, isn't there way more possibilities of how to organize the normal reduction cells? Or does it not matter, um, like, how you do that? It definitely matters, but uh, we are now making a sacrifice. And the sacrifices that we are making is because you have to train each time that your controller is going to recommend an architecture, you have to do a full round of training. And training on ImageNet I think these days it's faster. It takes around one day, but at that time it was taking around a week. Now imagine you have to do that for uh, 1,000 or 100,000 iterations. It's gonna be 100,000 days. Even today with our computing capacity, it's, it's not feasible. Basically you have to wait two years before your paper is published. Does that make sense? Yeah, thanks. Yes, you're absolutely right. In theory, it's possible, but in practice, in theory, it is possible to train it on ImageNet and come up with the best architecture on ImageNet. But in practice, it's not feasible. That's why people go to C part 10 and then they come up with the normal cell and the reduction. But what is our RMN doing? What is our search space for the normal cell? We are gonna start with two hidden states and these are from the previous layers. So these are from this layer prior to entering the normal cell or even here, it's gonna come for instance from reduction cell and the normal cell. So that's gonna give you H1 and H2. These are the inputs. So what choices do we have for the first operation in the normal cell? We can take H1 and for instance, you can do three by three pooling. That's one operation that you can do. Or you can do three by three convolution or one by one convolution, etc. Similarly on H2, you have a bunch of options. You can do convolution, you can do seven by seven convolution, etc. That's one choice that the RNN has to make. The other choice is how are we gonna combine the outcome of these two operations? Are you gonna add them? Are you gonna concatenate them? Uh, what are you gonna do? But whatever that you do is gonna give you H3. You take H3, you put it in a list, H1, H2, and H3. Now you have a choice. You can take, you need to take two of these. So you have a three out of two or two out of three choices. 
that you can make. You can take H1 and H2, you can take H2 and H3, uh, etc. So you have another choice to make here. Then the rest of it is similar to before. These operations, you have a choice to make. You're gonna do identity, or you're gonna do one by one convolution, or are you gonna do addition rather than concatenation? And then you keep doing that for a couple of blocks. Let's say you do it for five blocks. And those five blocks are gonna be inside your normal cell. So what are we doing now? We are opening the black box of normal cell. So we want to see how this guy is defined. We want to parameterize that. And as you can see, these are discrete choices that you have to make. So you cannot use gradient descent on that. And that's why a method like uh, reinforcement learning is gonna help us here because there are no gradients with respect to these parameters. These are discrete choices. Okay, so far so good. So what is our search space? This is gonna be what our recurrent neural network gonna do. We need to put a probability on which hidden state we are gonna select. So which of these are we gonna select? And all of them you can parameterize with a softmax because the softmax is gonna give you, give you the probability of state one, state two, or state three. So there is gonna be a softmax here outputting the probability of these states being chosen. And this is the P that we defined here. You can do the same thing for the second choice. Still, you have, let's say, three states, and which one are, uh, which one are you gonna choose? And that's gonna give you the second choice, the probability of making the second choice. And then you're gonna have a, you can put a softmax on that, and then that's gonna give you the probabilities of selecting each of those operations. And I'm gonna give you a list of what operations you can choose from. You can do the same thing for the second operation, and then you can select the method to combine the hidden state. How are you gonna combine this? Are you gonna concatenate, add them together, etc.? And then we are gonna repeat this B times. And B, you can say it's five. We're gonna repeat this operation five times. And as you can see, each time this selection is gonna have a different output size. For this step, you have two output sizes. For this one, you have three choices to make. For the next one, you have four choices to make, etc. So the softmax is gonna change dimensionality here. But that's not a big deal. It's just gonna give you a probability of choosing them. So what are our choices for the operations? That's where you are gonna put the softmax. You can either choose from identity, you can choose from a one seven and then a seven one convolution. You can choose from three by three, five by five. Actually it's five by five max pulling, three by three depth wise separable convolutions and depth-wise separable convolutions we saw it last session. You can have dilated convolutions. Uh, I'm gonna talk about dilated convolutions later on when we're gonna talk about uh, semantic segmentation. We're gonna go into more details of what is a dilated convolution. You can do three by three max pulling and five by five depth-wise separable convolution. So these are your choices for the yellow box here. And in the end, once the recurrent neural network is trained. It's gonna propose an architecture for your normal cell, and it's gonna propose a, an architecture for your reduction cell. So these are the optimal outcomes once the training is done. Actually, I'm gonna call this hyper training. Once uh, you came up with your best architecture, this is the best architecture that you're gonna see. The first two hidden states, HI minus one and HI, are coming from the previous layers which are gonna be H1 and H2. These two we know. And the next ones are gonna be chosen automatically. So all of these are chosen automatically. And you can see the choice of depth-wise separable convolutions, which is nice. So there is a separable convolution here. And by the way, the network is not trained for efficiency, but somehow it is choosing these three by three convolutions than separable ones. And the identity, separable, five by five, average identity, average pooling. It's interesting, it's not choosing max pooling, a bunch of addition and the con concatenation in the end. And the concatenation at the end is not chosen. It's what we do before going to the next step. Once uh, all of these five uh, blocks are determined, we are just gonna concatenate them and go to the next step. So I know you're gonna have a lot of questions. You can ask them now. So is this image showing the like results of what like this is what was chosen as the best architecture, I guess. Yes. And this is this like a if you repeated this process many times, would you get the same final architecture, or would it change every time? Like if you repeat the the hyper training, or uh, yeah, over and over, 
and it will come up with, an, with another one. It's not gonna give you the same. I don't even think the solution to that problem is unique. So each time you train it, I'm sure it's gonna come up with another architecture. And we can actually see it. You can take these two and just reorder them. That's gonna be a different architecture. But what is nice is that uh, in the normal cell, you are not seeing concatenation of these operations in the depth, but you are seeing it here. So now this iteration, the input to the separable convolution, this is just uh, what choices did we have at this point for this connection. This connection could be here, it could be here, it could be here, or it could be one of these two inputs. But now it's adding on the depth. If this connection was coming from the input, you would get an architecture like the one on the left. And so the, the H I minus one input is coming from the previous architecture, whereas the H I is coming from this architecture? No, let's take a look at this normal cell. H I minus one is coming from this. Sorry, H I is coming from this step and H minus one, H I minus one is coming from here. Okay, so that's like the uh, residual connection between blocks, I guess. Yes. Yes, exactly. So these are the residual connection. But what's it, what is interesting to me is the choice of separable convolutions in both of the normal cell and reduction cell. So any other questions? Yeah, so where in this process um, is it, like, where's the difference between the normal cell and the reduction cell? Like, how do you enforce that? Is there a different choice of operations? Uh, it's just when you are reducing the height and the width with a striding of two. And I guess it's happening here at HI and H minus one, HI minus one. You just reduce the resolution before doing the rest. Oh, I see. So each kind of each operation you're offering it to choose from has a stride of two. I no, it's just the first one. The first two ones, we force it. It's just reduce a dimension first and then do the rest. Oh, I see, I see, okay. Thanks. Reduce the resolution first and then do the rest. And this was actually what we were doing in other networks as well we reduce the resolution at the input to the cell. And then I'm guessing, do you have like numerical results and kind of the result of this whole thing? Is that next? Yes, that one I'm gonna explain in another paper because I want to compare the big picture. You mean in terms of accuracy on the image net? Yeah, like, like how much better it does than a standard network. Yes, I'm, I'm gonna explain about that in the next slide. So any other questions I saw? I heard somebody ask a question. Yeah, so certain things like aren't being chosen in the network, like sort of smaller parameters or like batch normalization. Um, is some of that just like sort of baked into the layers that you can choose from, the operations that you can choose from? After every convolution, there is gonna be a batch normalization. Okay. But yes, you're right. You can either put it or not put it. I have a, I have a quick question. Yes. Is is B five here? Repeat B times. Is that how we get five of these core blocks? Or uh, block is the right word. Core yeah. building blocks in each normal and reduction cell. Exactly. Okay. So you have five of them. And if you look here, you have five. This is one. That's two. That's three, four, and five here. And there are also five of them here. Okay, that makes sense. And yes, B is five. And the network is making 25 choices, the RNA. The search space seems so small. Is there a reason to believe that you need an RNN to fit it? Is it small? I mean, you have five times five, it's 25 choices, but that's not uh, the actual design space. The dimension of the design space are these. You can choose identity. You can choose one, seven, and then seven, one, three by three, five by five. You have these many choices. Per the output of the softmax here, there is gonna be another one here. You have two, only two choices here, addition and concatenation. And here you have two, three, four, five choices or six choices to make. So that's the actual design space. We are parameterizing the probability with an RNN, but then we are sampling from that probability. The sample space is huge, it's big and it's com combinatorically built big. It's a huge combinatorial problem. It could be identity and then any one of these two or any one of these two. Do you see what I'm saying? I see what you're saying, yeah. Like there's, you know, 13 operations for hidden state one, there's another 13 for hidden state two, and then, you know, you're multiplying those together. And then 
this starts getting big quick in in that sense. But I guess like, is there a reason to believe that you need something as as complex as a universal function approximator as, as opposed to like, you know, a linear function? Uh, I think uh, with the RNN, you can actually take a look at the depth of it. It's not gonna have that many parameters. Oh, okay. So the RNN itself is small. That makes sense to me then. That makes more sense, yeah. Okay, the thank you. And it's shallow. But this is smart, the way that uh, the predictions are being made. This is a combinatorial hard problem to solve. But if you approach it in a smart way, like what this paper is doing, then you are simplifying the problem significantly. And going back to the question, is this the only architecture that's gonna come out? No, because there is randomness. Each time you're sampling according to the probability that the RNN is outputting. So there is some randomness in training. Any other questions? Okay, let's move on to the next topic.